make a good point that would hold in a more scientific uh, analysis. Uh, simply because we don't know much about perception then. I tried to put that into a simple model. We are still working to, uh, on this to develop this. But if you have a set of destination attributes, a certain destination that is attractive for a given set of reasons, you have climate change coming in, then you can still do adaptation to some degree. Then that would you know, result in new destination attraction. And then comes the perception filter whatever the tourists make out of that. And that then translate into, translates into changing demand. But you know, this is a very simple model. Put that into practice with a very complex set of indicators and you know, you get a whole different picture. It's very, very, very complicated. And I, I think we're just at the very beginning of, of an understanding of how these uh, things work. Um, for instance, if you think about destination attributes, uh, travel motives, in all the models, the, the, the econometric models that try to quantify global tourist flow changes because of climate change, uh, you wouldn't distinguish, for instance, between different travel motives. But you know, if you travel to visit your friends, climate change might be quite irrelevant because you, you go there to visit your friends or your relatives, not because they are nice beaches or a given set of temperatures. So, there's a lot of things that we have to consider when we make any assumptions, but they are not considered in current models. There are some models coming up in Austria now that might be more reliable, but those models that we have at the moment are not. Then the perception filter itself uh, also relates to um, social, psychological uh, values and parameters that might be very re uh, relevant. For instance, if you have traveled to a destination over a period of 20 years, or you, if you own a, a, a summer house in, in a certain area, you might still go there even though there might be changes that make the destination less attractive. All of that, the loyalty to the destination and the resilience of people to go there has to be considered in any kind of discussion. And we don't do that at the moment, I think, in those models that exist to this point. Then the question, of course, how will climate change affect tourism in Australia? Well, I thought I should just present you with a couple of quotes from the IPCC. Uh, I haven't worked on that. Experts from Australia have written those. But regional climate change has occurred already since the 1950s. There has been a, a temperature increase between uh, 0.4 and 0.7 degrees Celsius with more heat waves, fewer frosts, more rain in northwest Australia, an increase in the intensity of Australian droughts, and a rise in sea level of about 7 centimeters. So you have some changes occurring already. You know that. Um, the climate of the 21st century is virtually certain to be warmer with changes in extreme events. Heat waves and fires are virtually certain to increase in intensity and frequency. Floods, landslides, droughts and storm surges are very likely to become frequent and intense. Significant loss of biodiversity is projected to occur by 2020 in some ecologically rich sites, including the Great Barrier Reef and Queensland Wet Tropics. Other sites at risk in include Kakadu wetlands, southwest Australia, subantarctic islands, and alp alpine areas. So if you take these verbatim, there's a lot of changes coming up that you can you know, be quite certain uh, that they uh, will become relevant for tourism in the future. But much more research has to be done in the future to understand what that will really mean, particularly if you think about timescales. I personally don't know anything about the tourist in 2050. So a lot of things will change and uh, we have to look at that. There is now um, one study uh, focusing on five case studies, uh, the Victorian Alps, uh, Kakadu National Park, that has been written um, by a team um, of uh, scientists from um, James Cook University and, and others. Um, and I think if you want to have a look into what's happening in Australia, this might be a good starting point for future work to be done. Now, from there, uh, we might move on to the other side, how tourism is contributing to emissions. And um, well, if you look at this, which is a summary from the report for UNWTO, um, we came up with tourism is causing about 5% of emissions of carbon dioxide. So most people will automatically say, yeah, well, is that relevant, 5%? Probably would say no. But, um, I think it's quite important to, to realize that uh, tourism is still, you know, 
uh, as Michael Hall put it, the, the, the tourism is a study of the of wealthy people. Tourism is a study of the rich. Uh, we, we estimate, for instance, that 98% of humanity do not participate in international air travel on an annual pay basis. So if you then look at emissions which are mostly coming from air transport, 40% of global tourism emissions are coming from air transport, then you have to consider that 98% of humanity never participate in an international flight on an annual basis. So it's very few people being responsible for these emissions, which is a very important aspect, I think, to uh, consider. Now, transport accounts for roughly 75% of emissions. Uh, then accommodation, uh, about 20%, one-fifth. And then activities, we are very uncertain about those, might be just 4 or 5% of global emissions. So this, again, is quite important when we discuss the issues that we should look at. And uh, we who are mostly concerned with the mitigation side think that air transport is probably the key aspect that we have to look at in the future, which of course is an important issue in Australia since you are so dependent on international aviation. Again, just last week, this report was released. So uh, the carbon footprint of Australian tourism, um, it's probably the most comprehensive assessment of uh, emissions from carbon tourism, and it's uh, very accessible now for everyone. Probably Australia is leading in these efforts, you know, identifying the impacts of tourism uh, on climate change and how tourism is impacted uh, by climate change on a global scale. So they are two very good reports. Now, looking into the future, again, the global picture, you can see that uh, currently we have this picture. Uh, by 2035, a business as usual um, uh, scenario considering technology efficiency gains would still lead to this conclusion that uh, emissions will probably increase by 150%. So when we think about global climate change and the need to reduce emissions, then this would be in quite stark contrast, I think, to what has to be done. Um, we have a strong growth projected for emissions from tourism. And then obviously tourism will become more relevant. Now, how much could we emit in the future? The IPCC says that uh, we should probably not exceed two degrees Celsius global warming by 2100. Beyond that level, most of the changes in the socioeconomic system because of environmental changes will be negative. So this is a purely anthropogenic kind of uh, understanding of climate change. But if we want to avoid global consequences that are negative for humanity, don't exceed 2 degrees Celsius change by 2100. Now, you can break these 2 degrees Celsius down to the maximum amount of emissions which are causing the global temperature rise that we can still emit in the next 100 years. And that can be quantified, it's 1,200 gigatons of CO2 that we can emit until 2100. Um, and that also means that you know, if we continue to increase in emissions, then we have to uh, achieve a very steep decline in emissions in the future. That would look like this. There's two blue curves here. Um, they would be showing we, we're here right now in terms of emissions in the next um, 10, 15 years, we could be peaking in emissions in 2015, 2020. The IPCC wants us to peak globally in emissions in 2015 and then to decline. If we further increase emissions up to 2015, then we have to decline in emissions by about 3% per year afterwards. That's quite a lot. That means quite a massive efficiency um, um, gain over the next uh, 50 years, 3% per year. That's quite massive. It's not a small number. But if we peak later, if we peak, for instance, in 2025 or something, then emission declines will have to be far steeper. Then we have to reduce emissions by almost 6% per year to stay in line with IPCC uh, uh, recommendations. And that is a huge problem, because we all know 6% per year is totally unrealistic. We'll never achieve that. Now, in contrast, you could look at tourism. We are here at the moment. So if you compare tourism to the current level of emissions, it's, it's totally irrelevant. But the point is that if you look at the growth in tourism in uh, an unrestricted growth emission scenario that's a pink line, then you could see that you know, 
in maybe 40, 50 years, tourism alone could be responsible for the total amount of emissions that we could still emit on an annual basis. And all of a sudden, tourism becomes quite important. Because a lot of people say, well, tourism is not important at the moment. Uh, there's other sectors that can do more in terms of emission reductions. Don't be mistaken. By 2050, there won't be any sector that has any room for emission growth. And that is a potential huge conflict that I'm seeing here. Also because at the moment, it's still quite cheap to reduce emissions. But in the future, uh, prices will probably increase exponentially for emission reductions. And then we'll be in deep trouble. So think about this at this point, because then you might be able to plan better for the future. Um, this obviously can be compared, once again, the tour, tourist emissions growth curve in comparison now to um, the uh, WTTC's goals of minus 25% emission reductions by 25 uh, and minus 50% emission reductions by 2005 levels by 2050, uh, sorry, 2035, which essentially means it's a, there's a huge gap in between what are the aspirational targets of the tourism industry and what is the projected growth rate for tourism-related emissions in the future. And this is stuff for huge conflict. Because obviously, here's a huge mismatch in between what the industry wants to achieve and what it probably could realistically achieve. Now, obviously, we could now ask, how can we achieve emission reductions? Uh, let's look into some sectors, because um, I think we can do a number of things, really. Um, the most important one, sorry, I pressed the wrong button here. But uh, what I want to look at very quickly is food, accommodation, and transports. Food, because nobody has looked at food. Still, food accounts for about 20 to 25 percent of the emissions that an individual is, uh, you know, emitting over a year. So food is a hugely underestimated issue in tourism. And I think that's one of the areas that we have to look at um, uh, rather soon. Uh, just to give you some, some examples. In tourism, large amounts of food are thrown away. Think about buffets, uh, where you have a huge amount of food. And uh, after everybody has eaten, there's still a lot of food, but they can reuse it the next day, so it has to be thrown away. Uh, think about per capita food consumption. I love to really observe people at, at uh, buffets in the morning these days because it's interesting how they eat. You know, their eating behavior is totally different than the eating behavior at home, I think. They always pile up huge amounts on their plates. Uh, it's always uh, the, the most, you know, energy intense products, like a lot of protein, a lot of animal f uh, meat and things like that. And then they discard also a lot of uh, that food afterwards. Um, then we have hardly any use of organic food in tourism uh, or local production. Uh, and there's a considerable use of foods that are quite uh, harmful to the environment. So tourism could really do a lot in actually becoming a leader in changing eating habits of people. Because what people might experience on their holiday, they might take home and practice at home. So if we managed in tourism to focus more on environmentally friendly foods, uh, I think that could be a huge um, achievement of tourism to really change uh, the sustainability um, you know, agenda of, of, uh, of the sector. Um, Accommodation, uh, just a new study actually by scientists from the University of Queensland showing that if you uh, look, for instance, at Australian uh, wind energy conversion system, the payback time for small accommodation establishments is just three to, po to four years. 